Jesse's right over here, Poulton. Uh oh. What you got, Jesse? This week on Kentucky Appeal. Oh, single. We've got bird dogs on point in eastern Kentucky, and we're after quail. Next, we'll travel nearly 400 miles west to Western Kentucky WMA for the Hunting Retriever Club Fall Grand. Then, all right, let's get to this first line here and see what we got on there. We're going to join biologists on the Cumberland River and search for one of the state's living fossils. It's all next on Kentucky Appeal. Kentucky Appeal. Every week, Kentucky Appeal brings you features on hunting and fishing across the state. What a nice fish. <laughs> opportunity to hopefully get that bird in the lake. Hey, we got another one over here. There he is. Ooh, a nice one too. Boy, he's healthy. What do we got? <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Got the first help. Barely made it out in the field. Got one. Big small mouth. Very nice. Double point. They're in there. There they go. <laughs> Look at that joker. Woo. <laughs> That's a good one. There. Look at that. Whoa, this is a good one. That's better than good, Chad. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Afield. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. Ask any old time hunter, and they'll tell you there's not a sight more beautiful than the rise of a covey of quail. So we headed to Eastern Kentucky to find out for ourselves. We're down here in Eastern Kentucky in Knott County this beautiful morning, and I'm here with Brandon. Brandon, this is a little different than the last time you and I hunted together. We're uh, running some dogs today. <laughs> a little smaller animal. <laughs> I'm with you. You know, so we're doing a small game hunt, and uh, every time we're down here elk uh, hunting or elk scouting, it seems like we always jump a lot of rabbits, mm. and we actually flush coveys of quail, which, you know, it's not real easy to find wild coveys of quail anymore. So. You know, you guys have got the perfect habitat for it. What are our chances of getting a covey up? I think we'll be good. We've ran these few spots probably four or five times this year already, so we've seen quite a bit, so we should be good. I'm gonna say two to three covey today. Especially decent sized coveys, 10, 12, 15 birds. That's, mm -hmm. that's a really good day. So who knows, let's go, let's see what happens. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Let's go, Waylon. Come on. We got Waylon. Waylon and Jesse. Waylon and Jesse. Waylon and Jesse. There you go. Let's go, bro. It's amazing. You look out over these hills and ridges, and it looks like it's all ankle high. It is a big difference when you step out in it. I like the road. <laughs> <laughs> Wayland, here. I think he's pointing on the hill there. Oh, you got you got them pointing in two different places? Yeah, I'd say they're walking, feeding this morning. Sitting up here right in that little small patch there. Think we got a bird? Yeah, maybe. Let's walk in and find out. Easy, Jesse. Jesse's locked up right yeah. here. Whoa. Well, that was quicker than I expected. <laughs> I couldn't swing any further. <laughs> I went, I saw it here, one single went out this way. You think you got, you got anything down? Ah, uh, worth checking. <laughs> Good job. Oh, look. Good job, you did get one. Good job, girl. Very nice. Look at there. Girl. Pretty little creatures, aren't they? Yo, beautiful bird. Let's go find another cubby. Let's go. Go find another cubby. Come on, girl. Jesse's right over here, Bolton. Uh oh. What you got, Jesse? Oh, single. Oh, oh, oh. They're moving a lot of this boy. Wow, that, now that was a bunch of quail. Yes, they were, that spread out. I mean, that was a bunch. Time we uh, got our attention on this single that went out this way, they all slipped out the backside on it. Yeah. 
I don't think uh, either one of us got a real good, no. good look, a long, long shot. But I was shooting through all the mobs. I knew that wasn't gonna go good. <laughs> but, you know, you flush, you flush a covey that size, you gotta pick a bird and try to make the best of it. Well, you gotta find that bird, buddy. What you got, buddy? Wow. That ear laid back. What you got, buddy? I don't know, it's usually when he stands up, head up, it's usually, whoa. Oh, that was a cubby. Yep. On point? He looks it. It's a woodcock. <laughs> that season's not in. <laughs> Leave it be, Bubby. Come on. <laughs> sure was, pointed a woodcock. Brandon, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed today. It was a great day. I said it earlier, I think that, that one of the most beautiful things you can see in the state of Kentucky is a cubby rise. It's shocking, first off, but then secondly, watching them take off in all the different directions. Well, I've said it before, I'll say it again, you live on a small slice of heaven. Hey, every I appreciate it's it. It's different opportunities every time. You That's guys uh, got opportunities to fish and, and hunt and Big game hunt, and today it was the small game, and uh, today may have been my favorite. I'm with you. I've said it from the get-go. I love turkey hunting, deer hunting, elk hunting, but quail hunting it's takes the cake. Most people start out fishing by buying one rod and reel, and they go fishing. You know, and that really works well to get you started into fishing, but as you want to start trying new techniques of fishing, you may realize that you may not have the right kind of line or the right pound test line for whatever technique you want to try. As you progress into fishing and you start fishing for multiple different species and a bunch of different techniques, you're going to very likely find yourself having a whole pile of rod and reels. Now, how do you keep it all separated? How do you know what kind of line is on what rod and reel? Well, that can be tricky. And here's a little technique that I like to use. Go right here and put a little piece of medical tape. This is something like you put on your finger and it's very durable. And I will write on there with a magic marker or an ink pen a couple of things. First off, I'll put the pound test, it's 30. The material, B stands for braid, and then the date in which I put this line on the spool. Why do I do that? Well, braid can last up to two years. It'll last for a long, long time. Fluorocarbon on the other hand, you know, if you use fluorocarbon quite a bit and it's out in the it's out in the sun, you might want to trade it out about every two to three months maximum. So, this one here, what what do I have on this? 8F523. That's eight pound test on a spinning rod. Fluorocarbon line, great fishing line if you want to use a real sensitive technique. This line may not last more than two or three months. It's time to replace it. So I need to know the date that it was put on here. Another technique that I sometimes use is just by taking a Sharpie and writing it right on the spool. And I try to put it in a place that my fingers don't touch and rub it off. So I use right here. This is a silver Sharpie and it says 12M. That's 12 pound test monofilament. I write that on there. Now I don't have the date on that particular one. Should have the date on it. It's very good to have that. Now, once you get that on there, how do you get it off? Well, a little bit of alcohol We'll wipe that right off and you can start fresh again and put whatever the new line that you plan on and intend putting on your rod and reel, you can write that back on there. I'll tell you what, technique fishing, one of the most important things is matching the material and the pound test of the line that you're fishing with whatever technique you're fishing. And if you always know what type of line is on your rod and reel, then you will always be able to match that to whatever technique that you want to fish. <laughs> oh my god. Look at that one. <laughs> Are you a dog lover and you're looking to bond with your dog or spend more time in the field? Maybe you should consider joining your hunting retriever club. So we're in uh, Paducah and we're doing the fall green. Without a doubt, this is the best dogs you'll see in the country anywhere. I mean, this, this is the best venue there is. We had 998 dogs in there. I think we ended up with like 936 that were running here. We got 10 different sites five water, five lands, and uh, we're judging these retrievers on a standard, the grand standard. 
Well, you'll see primarily Labrador Retrievers. Up until this last year, they were the top registered breed in the United States with the American Kennel Club. You will see some Golden Retrievers. Uh, you will see some Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. You will see some Boykin Spaniels. Potentially, there are Poodles here, standard Poodles as well, which many people do not know was one of the original, if not the original, retrieving breed. So those are primarily what you're going to see. The whole country's here. I mean, we're here from coast to coast. The judges are here from coast to coast. So yeah, we're seeing the whole country. I mean, we even have people from Canada. I think the first time you run this thing, you're just addicted. You get into it, there's a lot of people here. We're all family here. Everybody gets along. Um, it's a great thing. We do a series of land and a series of water. So each dog that runs through here is required to run two land series, two water series, and if they make it that far, then the upland series. Water series, let's start with that. It's like an everyday duck hunt. Let's say we go to, uh, down here to the WMA, we put our decoys out, we conceal ourselves, we conceal our dogs, and we kill our ducks when they come in, we send our dogs on the retrieves. There are three marked retrieves that the dog will actually see fall. The dog will proceed to the area of the fall, pick the bird up, retrieve the hand, and then we run a blind retrieve. So a blind retrieve is where a bird has fallen and the dog doesn't know where it's at, but you know as a gunner or possibly your hunting buddy saw it and said, over there by that stick, there's one laying there. So the dog and handler work as a team at that point. The dog proceeds to that area. If he gets offline, we stop them with a whistle. We cast them with our hands and with whistles until they achieve that area, pick up the bird, bring it back. We also have what's called a diversion. And the best way to explain a diversion in real terms is, uh, let's say we're, we're out here, we're hunting, and we've killed our birds and we've got a bird come in as the dog is coming back with the retrieve. We kill that bird, the dog has to hold the bird that it has in its mouth, keep it, bring it to you, and not break for the bird that comes in. And then once we get the duck from the dog on the original retrieve, we send it for the diversion bird. We also have what's called an honor. In a real life scenario, uh, I go hunting, I've got my dog, my buddy comes with me, he has his dog. So the best case scenario is we let those dogs take turns picking up birds. That way they get the most amount of work. Uh, a dog on honor means that he has to sit and watch while the other dog makes a, the retrieves. The guns are fired, the dog makes a retrieve. Your dog has to sit quietly, watch, and be steady during that part. So it's skills that the dog uses when they actually duck hunt or goose hunt or dove hunt in this case. They're being scored on, on marking, memory, control. We want the dogs to be biddable, and by that we mean we want the dog to be able to work with the handler. This is so much teamwork, especially at this level, and that's what makes these dogs great. They work as, as a team with the handler. They're a dog that you would be proud to take hunting and be steady and quiet in the blind, pick your birds up, would be obedient coming in and out, not break, not knock guns over. Safety is a huge aspect of what we do too, and, and safety is also plays a part with the dog. What differs us, we are a hunt test program instead of a field trial program. And so we don't run against each other, we run against a standard, an established standard that uh, has two judges and the judges set up the test and they, they see what they want and they want to see a, a grand champion show us. That's their grand standard by our rules. They judge the dogs individually against that standard. The Western Kentucky Wildlife Management Area has a great property for us. This is our third time being here. We love these grounds. The large fields, they're managed to have some cover and some broken areas, and that, that allows us to be able to set up our marks and blinds and add difficulty degrees to the marks and blinds at the grand level. Kentucky Wildlife, it just does a great job out here managing the ground, the road structures, you know, the pond management. It, it's just, we love this place. I got into it, as many others do, as I'm a duck hunter and uh, chase ducks all over the country. I had a duck dog that I had gotten and, uh, you know, wanted something else to do with it. The breeder and trainer that I got my, my dog from suggested that I find a retriever club. And I, at the time, I lived in St. Cloud, Florida, and I found the Central Florida Hunting Retriever Club and got involved with them, and that's been 25 years ago. And so we enjoyed it. It gave us something to do in the off time. It gave me like friends to go and train with and improve my dog, and I made a better hunting dog. 
What brings me back is the people and the dogs. Is just that's, you know, these are the greatest handlers we've got from just ordinary person to doctors are here. And we're all the same. We're all dog trainers and dog enthusiasts and enjoy the hunt test program. Now let's head south in Kentucky and jump on the Cumberland River and learn a little more about a unique fish, the lake sturgeon. Well, the Cumberland River in the middle of the wintertime, I'll tell you what, it doesn't get any more stunningly beautiful than this, does it? It is certainly beautiful down here. It's a great place to be. Today we're doing something that I've never experienced before. We're actually in search of what is gonna be the state's largest fish. You know, for a number of years now, we've been stocking lake sturgeon into this system. Uh, and we've got fish that are, are up above 20 plus pounds and approaching 50 to 60 inches if we're able to get some of our older fish today. Lake sturgeon, we've been reintroducing them back here in Kentucky now since, what, 2007? 2007 is our first year class. The first stocking went in in 2008. So we're committed to a 20 year restocking effort. So we're getting close to the end of that stocking frame right now. And so far we've seen pretty good survival. 20 years is a long study, but that's what it takes to learn a little bit about lake sturgeon. And we're gonna learn a little more about lake sturgeon today. You're gonna pull some data. Hopefully we catch some. And we're gonna learn a little more about why we're reintroducing them here in Kentucky. All right, let's get to this first line here and see what we got on there. It's not like most fishing. We wait till we have a fish to put water in the live well. With 400 hooks, we feel pretty confident we're gonna have one, huh? Yeah, these lines are set kind of with the current. Helps us avoid some tangles. Also, lake sturgeon tend to feed as they go up the river, so. They'll eat benthic macroinvertebrates, things like that when they're younger. They'll continue to eat that throughout their life cycle, even, even large, you know, 30 plus pound fish. However, once they get big enough to gape size in their mouth, how wide their mouth is, uh, will become large enough that they can start um, preying on smaller fish species as well. So today you're using all night crawlers though, right? Today we're using all night crawlers. It helps keep things standardized in terms of the data. I have to ask you, why this location? Why here this time of year to try to catch them? We are kind of looking at their migration patterns. It's part of the study, so there are some telemetry studies going on right now. Yeah, an earlier portion of the study uh, was telemetry. We've wrapped that up. Uh, and we've moved on to a monitoring stage to see how these fish are, are surviving, growing, just kind of how our stocking efforts are, whether they're being successful or not. All right, well good. Let's well, see what we have. Hey, with night crawlers, who knows what you may have? You never know. About every fish I know will eat a night crawler, right? Absolutely. <laughs> And a mud puppy, I already seen that joker. Yeah, occasionally we do catch them. Sometimes we have lines with several on them. Uh, for the most part, they're eating night crawlers as well. So we'll catch them and we'll take the hooks out of them and release them and most of the time they swim off just fine. We've caught them every year that we've been doing this. You might catch 20 plus on a line. Now, people need to realize that there's a difference between a mud puppy and another big species of salamander we have here in Kentucky that we're actually trying to reintroduce and that's the hellbender. These are not hellbenders, these are mud puppies, right? Right, typically they're gonna inhabit different types of areas. Uh, hellbenders are gonna be more in your highland streams often. These mud puppies are not getting anywhere near to the size that hellbenders are at maturity either. Yeah. Look at there, channel cat. Channel cat, Matt. And typical for a channel cat that's been on a line, he's got that thing twisted and curled as many times as he can. So you can see they're pulling these hooks. Now they're gonna rebait and put these back out to pull more samples tomorrow, but you can see how they're managing these. If you've ever pulled trot lines, you've probably seen this is a box that just has some cuts in it, and they'll pull each one of these individual hooks and they'll spin that box around, and that helps them manage and keep the line from being tangled. Now when they go to put it out, they'll go in reverse, they'll pull them up and bait them, back up and pull the line right on out and put it back on the bottom. Channel cat, Matt, just go. popped off. Quick release. Actually getting a, uh, a quick release is uh, speeds up the process today, so that's yes, a good thing. Yes, it does. We got two red spotted newts here that we also got that actually weren't even on the hook. They had just wrapped around the dropper. Oh, we got a leg sturgeon. I'm gonna need to reach back and get that uh, net out of there. There we go. Wrapped up in there. There you go. 
Well, there's our first lake surgeon. Now this is uh, it's a little bit younger fish. What do you think, your best guess, what do you think this is? A two-year-old fish? That's probably a three-year-old fish three -year -old right there. Fish. Okay. So and you guys are gonna check this thing to figure out how old you think it is, get some measurements. What other data will you be getting today? Right, so we're gonna take total length, uh, fork length, which is essentially to the fork of the tail. They've got what they call a heterocircle tail, so that top half of the tail can be a little bit longer. So sometimes fork length is a little more indicative of growth. We'll also be weighing these fish and putting a tag in them so that if we recapture them, we can kind of follow them as far as when we caught them, how large they were at that point in time. Got that line pulled in. We're gonna head on down to our next one and see what we've got on that one. We got sturgeon about to oh, surface. Fair, fair. Sturgeon about to surface. Awesome. There we go. Oh, that's a good one. All right, so we're just checking for a pit tag here. And this one does not appear to be tagged. Looks like a right 7-8 on right. the scoot removal. Fork length 21-0, total length 24-1. Total weight 214. All right, so we're gonna be putting this pit tag into this fish now, and that'll allow us to track it if we recapture it. And just to make sure that it's in. And we've got it in that fish successfully. So this is a nice example of a lake sturgeon. You know, you've got the three rows of bony plates, the dermal plates that cover the skin, and these plates are large and really sharp with sharp keels when the fish is young. They tend to get smaller as the fish grows and the keels become more blunt. Um, the interesting part of the sturgeon around the head and the snout or rostrum is they've got a lot of uh, sensory cells, especially on the underside of the head. These are called barbels, which are just fleshy tentacles that hang from the snout, and they are covered with taste buds. And they use these, they drag them along the bottom in search of food, and they'll actually suck in the sediment, like silt and mud, and screen out the insect larvae. They extrude the mud and sediment out the gills, so that's how they feed. Their vision is not super poor, but they don't have highly developed vision. They feed by taste, and they rely heavily on their sense of smell. It has a cartilage skeleton. They are the most primitive or ancestral of the bony fishes. And so essentially they're living fossils and haven't really changed much since prehistoric times. The cool thing is about these fish is that they are very long-lived fish. The bad thing is for on a restoration side, that this fish, if it's a male or a female, may not be able to produce offspring for how long? If it's a female, they don't reach sexual maturity until they're 20 to 25 years old. So the males are a little bit sooner, 15 to 20 years. This fish has several more years. If it's a female, more than that before it's sexually mature. When they do reach maturity, they only spawn on average every four years. So you've got a low reproductive potential slow maturity, all these things are what make them so vulnerable to overharvest. If you catch one, we ask that you return the fish back to the water, but we would also like to have information on your capture date, a photograph of the fish, the location, and any other information like the bait that was used, the depth where you caught the fish. All of this helps us with our monitoring efforts. We got another one coming up. Oh. A real good one. So this project will go on for the rest of the month, trying to get a bunch of individuals and collect all that data to help you guys manage this species. Yeah, we'll be continuing to set trout lines at a few different sites here and on the main stem of the Cumberland for years to come. And it's very cool to get to see a fish that most of us people out here that are outdoorsmen, we don't get to see that. So thanks for bringing us along today. Yeah, no very, problem, Chad. Very interesting work. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. 
Waylon Goodwin went to the Kentucky River in search of his first smallmouth bass, and he was successful. Nice job. Here we have Emmy Lou, who took a shot at this deer during the Free Youth Weekend and had her friend Josie help her track it down. Nice job. Here we have Eric Mills with a nice buck that he took on public land. He had a biologist age this deer at seven and a half years old. Check out this beautiful six and a half pound bass that was caught by seven year old JR in Cox's Creek. Great fish. Kenzie Scott took this nice buck in Webster County during the Free Youth Weekend. She said all of her siblings, Kenzie, Anna, and James love to go hunting. Nice job. Mandy and Tasha tagged out on opening day in Knott County with these two giant bucks. Congratulations. It's gonna be super chilly here in Kentucky this week. So it's a good time to hit the field in search of predators or break out that rod and reel and get them ready for spring. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.